ladies and gentlemen, John Reese Davis. Oh, silly you. People with no homes to go to. It's sad, isn't it, really? <laughs> okay, now, I've got a resolution today. I'm not going to talk so long each time because I have to keep my assistant happy. She says, concise and short. So, fire away. Who's got... Do you want to ask a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we have a chair for you if you don't... If you don't want to stand up well, why don't I, why would I want to sit down when all these... You can stand if you'd like. Yeah, very good. Would you like to stand? Okay. Right. If, I just want to say hello to you. It's been a while since I saw you last. It was in um, Oakland, California. We were at a convention together. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, you actually were on Star Trek Voyager, the show that I worked on. You played uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I did, yes. But unfortunately, all of your scenes were, were with Miss Kate Mulgrew and with none of the other cast members, so I never got a chance to work with you. But one thing I just figured out was I was looking back into some old IMDb stuff. Um, you were also in a movie called Glory Days years ago where you played a character of Luther. Do you remember this movie? It was filmed by the director, Rich Wilkes, uh, was the writer, director of this, filmed in Santa Cruz, California. That's with, right. Yes. I was supposed to play the character of Slosh, but I ended up turning that down because I had to do Star Trek Voyager instead. So I would have worked with you in that movie, but it now, never happened. Now, let's just see. Now, was it a, the right choice? You could have made this movie, what was it called again? Glory Days. Or... Star Trek Voyager. Hmm. Hard choice. Difficult choice. And you've had a bloody brilliant career ever since. I, I, <laughs> pretty much. But I'm so happy to see you here. I'm so well, happy. I'm delighted. I tell you what, you know, I've done one or two things before. I actually did, did Voyager, but my son, who must have been well in his mid-late thirties, when he heard that I was doing that, he said, Dad, you arrived at last. You, you, you're on Voyager. <laughs> Wow! He said that. That's very kind words for him, to your son. Okay, we have microphones set up here and here. So for those of you that want to ask questions to the esteemed Welsh actor, which I learned that from you last time I met you. Oh, very good, yes. boy. Very good. Not English. Welsh. Rhys Davis. Yes, Rhys Davis. Rhys Davis. Said it wrong. Davies. Davies. All right. Do we have questions? Anybody? Oh, of course. Oh, look at that. We have someone dressed as Gumby over here. Gumby. Come on up. A uh, huge fan of your work, John. Uh, quick question. Uh, back in Indiana Jones, you did a scene with uh, Harrison Ford where you caught a grape above his face. I'm kind of curious how often that had to be done without him getting hit in the face by the date. There's one bitch in every audience, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did actually do it a few times, but, uh, you know, it, it's not that difficult. In those days, I was young and nimble and almost as, uh, almost as nimble as this fellow here, you see. So, yeah, yeah, no, we did it a few times. But by and large, we were shooting very quickly. Uh, and there is an immediacy to, to the whole of the film that, uh, that reflects that, you know, let's shoot it and, and, and just catch the essential. And I did manage to catch that essential anyway. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, next, next in line, please. Don't be shy. Hi. Um, I wondered, uh, which of the two roles did you enjoy doing more? Playing Salah in Indiana Jones series or Dugati in King Solomon's Mines? <laughs> well, um, King Solomon's Mind was directed by a wonderful old English director called J. Lee Thompson, who d directed The Guns of Navarone and uh, a few other uh, superb films. Actually, I think before he was 20, he had three plays of his on the West End stage in London. In those days, directors really did know quite a lot about directing. Um, but you, you fall in love with all these characters, don't you? I mean, don't you fall in love with everyone that you've done? 
More or less, yeah. Uh, tell me about the next one. <laughs> oh, we'll not go there. Okay. Um, we have a question on this side. Yes. Come on down. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Mark. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Edmonton. And uh, in sliders and roles where you act with younger actors, do you find it hard sometimes when they're like, you know, a big age difference and maybe you're more distinguished and they're, you know. Yeah, the little buggers keep you on your toes all the time. <laughs> I, I did a, a, a little film, just a little short film for a young director the other day. It consisted of me and a marvelous Irish actress whom I had never worked with before and a 14-year-old girl and they wiped the floor with me. <laughs> they, they I, no, I kid you not. They were marvelous, and I was terrible. Yes, young actors that are bloody peril. We can run rings around you. Thank you. Did someone give you this as a gift? This? Oh. Hey, is the lady who gave me this as a gift here today? Is she here? Okay. Well, we thank her anyway. It's, um, a, it's, a, it's a Canadian it, scarf. It's a, it's a Canadian scarf. Yes. But, okay. okay. Give me that. Uh, question over here, please. I, I uh, absolutely love your work on sliders and everything else back in those days, and the new stuff too. I was just wondering if you could talk to um, your experience as Professor Arturo a little bit. Arturo is a wonderful character. Um, and unfortunately, as one of the writers explained to me, they didn't want me to play him quite that way. They wanted me to be the bad doctor in Lost in Space which had been done rather well before, and why would you want to reprise it? Unfortunately, I kept wandering into young professors of physics who used to say, look, it's very hard to get young people involved in science, and we often use uh, uh, sliders to start discussing a theoretical problem in, in a physics class and things like that. And the other day in Saskatoon, I actually met a Huge, I think he must have been about six foot six lad who looked as if he could, you know, bend steel bars with his teeth. And he had actually written his master's thesis on something along the lines of uh, would ethical considerations be identical in an alternate universe? Which uh, just goes to show how influential something like sliders can be. Max Otero is a great character, and uh, it grieves me. You know, we could still be on the air. We could have been like Star Trek if, if we'd had the writing, but you got the bloody writers. Oh, did I say that out loud? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to bring up a, a role that you did uh, many, many years, many moons ago, uh, in the TV miniseries Shogun. You were the Portuguese uh, sailor Rodriguez in that, yeah. that, right? And I love Shogun. Can you speak to that a little bit? You have hey, Inglés! <laughs> if we should meet at sea, you and your ship armed and me and mine, then look to your life. That's all I came to say. Yeah, well, great character. You know, I, I, can I let him into a trade secret now? Yeah. All of us actors, look for the actor-proof part. That is the part that is so well written that even we can't screw it up. <laughs> and Shogun was an actor-proof part. You know that when Eric Berkovici, who did the, uh, the film adaptation, comes up to me and says, now listen, you son of a bitch, you're playing me, get it right. <laughs> And uh, working with marvelous Richard Chamberlain, who taught us all so much about professionalism under extreme circumstances. And the great Toshiro Mufuni. Oh, Mufuni was in character. Uh, the only time I ever saw Richard annoyed was one day he came in and I said, Are you all right? And he said, yes. Every morning I come in, I say, good morning, Mr. Mufuni. And he goes, if he does, keeps going on going, I think I shall hit him one of these days, said Richard. 
she, uh, Paul Mafuni was going through a bad divorce at the time and was being heavily ridiculed in Japanese newspapers, so he was feeling a bit raw, I think. But a great, 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 great series. Where did you film that mostly? What, what? All in Japan. All in Japan. Then. All in yeah. Japan. And uh, marvelous. Uh, I mean, those Japanese actors are so good. I mean, they're, well, actually, most actors at that level are good anyway, wherever you go in the world. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> All ready to wipe the floor with you. Very good. Anyway, I guess yes, you liked it. Yeah, no, I, I think that myself and my family and probably many people here we, we were anxiously waiting for each episode to each you know each movie to come out each mini TV movie it was do you wonderful. Know, do you know what it did do? It introduced America to sushi. It was glued on with medical medical but it sort of bonds to the cell of your skin and it's not designed to be taken off on a daily basis so when you, every time you take it off you take a few cells and in the end i lost all the skin all the skin around there around the eyes i looked like a red eyed panda <laughs> and, and of course once you you know when you remember when you used to fall over and graze yourself when you were a child you know how that that large area of red lymph colored sort of stuff just under the skin it was all around my face i look hideous you'll love this i the then significant other said to me one day honey i don't know how to say this but i can't bear to look at you any longer i've got to go back to l.a the shark went hungry that year <laughs> sorry actors don't. thank you for sharing that with all of us <laughs> I'm going to make a t-shirt for you. The shark went hungry that year. Okay. Um, this lady right here, please. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for enduring what you did to bring us Gimli in terms of the makeup. And also to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for coming to Edmonton to see us all. Uh, I think many of us here were raised on your Gimli and Sala. Um, I just wanted to ask you if there was an actor that you preferred to work with on Lord of the Rings and one that you despised working with on Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Everyone I met on Lord of the Rings was not only a very good actor, they were actually very good people. There was one miserable asshole on Lord of the Rings. He was grumpy, he was disaffected, and uh, unfortunately, I wore his boots every day. <laughs> there was only one asshole on Lord of the Rings, that was me, I'm afraid. They were, it, 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 they were great. I, and. Um, I'd work with any of them again. They are marvelous and wonderful. I mean, how can you not love Aston? I mean, how can you not love Billy Boyd? I, um, I, I saw my friend Legolas' uh, new film um, the other day. I, th I just, you know, his performance is wonderful. The film isn't that wonderful, but... <laughs> But, uh, but really, a really lovely performance. Um, Vigo, of course, is, is not only a great actor, a good actor, he's also a, he could earn his keep as a photographer, a professional prof photographer. He could earn his keep as a professional artist. You remember the three-hander he did, um, with Michael Douglas, where he's the young artist and Douglas discovers he's having this affair. Yeah, his affair. Now, in the artist's studio, all those pictures was his work. Uh, and he's not a bad poet either. And he can catch fish in any stream possible. <laughs> and he sleeps with his soul, poor fellow. <laughs> don't know what, I'm, don't know what how, how that affects his love life, but there you are. Um, Mar these, are, uh, uh, these are marvelous people, Sean Bean, brave, wonderful, charismatic, scared of flying in bloody helicopters. <laughs> We'd fly over it as he was legging it over hill and dale to get to the location. Hi, Sean! <laughs> 
My favorite short story is, I, I, I've flown to LA, I've done a day's business in LA, and then I'm going to catch the next flight from LA to London, Air, um, Air New Zealand. Great, uh, great, great firm to fly with, by the way, from New Zealand. Um, and uh, so I'm in, I'm in the first class lounge, and along comes Shaw. And if he has one, he has 10 pieces of baggage with him. And there's a little old couple there. And I said, Sean, my dear fellow, let me, let me give you a hand. And uh, 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 who are these people? And uh, your mum and dad, or something like that? He says, no, as a matter of fact, uh, I'd like to introduce you to them, but uh, I, I don't actually know their names. They were just this elderly couple who were being helped by this strange young man. They hadn't got a clue who he was. And, um, and he was just doing the right thing. Quality man. Wow, that's a good story. I like that one. Thank you. Um, over here, please. What is your favorite story to tell, either from your career or in your personal life? something like this. Once upon a time, and a very good time it was too, there was a moo cow coming down the road. It passed the house where Betty Byrne lived. When he was old, he was going to marry Betty. When you wet the bed, first it is warm, and then it gets cold. Portrait of the artist as a young man. Sorry, couldn't resist that one. There you are. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, over here, please. So recently, we've done a lot of work with uh, Squadron 42. I was wondering how that acting experience with motion capture was different from what you've done before. Uh, motion capture is very difficult. By the way, I've just, uh, I, I just uh, spent, when I say just, it was last year, or was it even the year before? Um, uh, Mark Hamill and um, Johnny Depp and I running around in spandex with little bottles on our noses and head and 48 motion picture cameras uh, catching our thing for, for a, a, new, uh, a new thing called Squadron 42 um, by Chris Roberts, who's the man who did, um, uh, who, uh, um, come on, you, you guys who do these games, which one was it? Um, oh dear, well I never played it, but I did it the film, so sort of, yeah. Anyway, very interesting motion capture, because by God, it reduces the stomach, and I get a six-pack as well, apparently, yes. <laughs> and very different, very different, very silly. Love it. But did you mention SpongeBob? <laughs> no, you didn't mention SpongeBob. Okay, well, I'm old and deaf, so what does it matter? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Well, we'll get over here, please. Hi there. Um, my husband and I recently did a tour of New Zealand to all the Lord of the Rings filming locations, and I just wanted to know what was your favorite location? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a wife and a daughter and a little home in New Zealand. And I guess my favorite location would be looking out of the bedroom window over Lake Fungape, uh, and beyond the Lake Fungape, uh, We've got about 50 mile views. Uh, in terms of locations, we went to the places that probably most New Zealanders have never seen. Uh, I urge you, those that love to travel, uh, to, to visit New Zealand. It's a fabulous place, and uh, like Canada. And oh, yes, apropos of what somebody else said a minute ago, it is a joy to be back in Canada and here in Edmonton. You are such a bright, clever, wonderful people. Um, the only difference from you and New Zealand is that they're so laid back, they're almost horizontal. <laughs> but otherwise, wonderful. Uh, I second your comments about how amazing New Zealand is, and for people who have never been there, um, literally, when you watch Lord of the Rings, the 
common misperception is that everything is CGI, all the backgrounds are all computer generated. No, that's literally the... I tell you, there were more than one occasion when we arrived on a set, we saw these hills all around, these mountains all around, snow-capped with blue skies, and you said, no one will believe this. They will think it's a painted backdrop. It was just breathtaking. Just gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. Next question over here, please. Hi, like, I really like Lord of the Rings movies, and I was just wondering which one was your favorite to act in. I would have liked the one where you and I acted in it. Because <laughs> I think you're probably a hobbit, are you not? <laughs> Are you a hobbit or are you a pointy-eared devil? <laughs> you see, the problem with your pointy ears is he cheats all the time, all the time. I mean, anyone can go. <laughs> but for real wet work, you need an axe. Now, my preferred technique is this. I like to swing at them, parry first of all, swing at them and catch them behind the knee. Breaks the knee off nicely there. They go down and then I scramble their brains with the axe. So any film, any part of it where I was swinging the axe would have been my favorite scene. Yes. Uh, I can see you're going to be a mighty hobbit yourself. How old are you now, sir? Thirteen. Thirteen is very old, very good. <laughs> very, very good. Well, a joy to meet you. And remember, for wet work, you need what? An axe. Very good. <laughs> Who thought you would get an impromptu Gimli right here, right? Okay, over here, please. Hi, thank you so much for coming and uh, with sharing with us today. And I just wanted, well, a couple things. I just wanted to say that as a person of a shorter stature, I really related to Gimli. And there's been a lot of times where I've been like, toss me. Don't tell me else. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Toss nobody, me. nobody tosses a dwarf. <laughs> I mean, 
let's face it, were you to become a professional architect, uh, archaeologist rather, you would be, do so because you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. I must have met 250 archaeologists who became archaeologists basically because they loved the movies. But, um, I mean, just imagine. I mean, how many archaeologists that you met can say, I was there when we discovered uh, the Ark of the Covenant. I was there when we discovered the Holy Grail. I mean, let's face it, it does put me into one of the two people of the greatest archaeologists of the 20th century, I think. Thank you for that question. Over here, please. Hello, I've enjoyed your movies very much, and I was wondering what kind of movies do you like to watch to relax? What's your favorite? I'm a sucker for sci-fi, if it's good sci-fi. I mean, the classics, obviously, one loves Casablanca, Casablanca. one will always watch Casablanca. Uh, Les Enfants du Paradis, uh, my own beloved friend, uh, Jean Moreau, who died the other day, any of the films that she did, uh, Viva Maria, um, Jean, uh, Jean Moreau, by, by the way, was an exceptional person. You know, most actresses are either, they, they, are, they are either goddesses or the humans. Very few people can, can combine both. And, and Jan was both a goddess and a warm human being who had lived and enjoyed life and liked men and was just glorious. Sorry, I prefer absolutely nothing. Um, what's your favorite film of the way? Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> You've got very good taste, young man. Hmm. Thank you for that okay. question. Over here, please. Um, hi, I did enjoy your work on The Untouchables. I was just wondering, what was your most favorite part about working on it and your least favorite? Well, would Chicago winter and cold answer the second bit? <laughs> um, I, look, my father was a policeman, um, and he was a good policeman, and it's an impossible job particularly these days, I mean, anything that you do, you must assume is being recorded on camera. Anything you can do will be misinterpreted. You cannot afford to have any sort of mistake because it will bite you, it will dog you, it will stay with you for the rest of your life. And that's also true of all you guys and girls who are on uh, you know, things like Facebook and stuff like that. If I had written some of the stupid things that I said when I was an aggressive, nutty teenager, and they were still winging around the ether now, I would have destroyed my career. There ought to be an absolute moratorium on anyone using the internet, particularly like Facebook and all those other, you know, tweeters and twitters. I don't do that sort of stuff. Um, nobody under the age of 30 should be allowed it. <laughs> um, oh, what was the question? Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, over here, please. Hi, I was just wondering, what is your all-time favorite set screw-up? Like, someone uh, tripping and falling and hurting themselves or something like that? Actually, one of the ones I do remember, I was a young actor, I was playing probably my first leading role as a professional. I think I was 27 years old and I was playing Falstaff and we were touring Merry Wives of Windsor. We played at Manchester Opera House, which holds 2,200 people, on a Saturday afternoon when there was an international rugby match on. I counted 43 people in the audience. You understand that most, most of the cast came on and went, no energy. But when you're playing the lead, you've got to get through the whole damn thing. So, 
I, I accepted the challenge. I went on and, and, you know, we would re-block it. And instead of me playing the scene here, I would go around there like that. And you would go, oh, you saucy bugger. And, <laughs> and, 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 and your performance would be different. Uh, and, and that's the way, that's why people do these things, keep them alive sometimes. Um, anyway, so I went on to do a scene with, uh, when, when, when poor old Falstaff has been, has been thrown into a mill pond, you know, in, in a laundry basket. And I came on, and it was an entirely different set. And I thought, oh dear, I think I'm right. I don't think they've set the damn scene. I think they've... And I said, so I, I had to improvise. Bard off! Bard off, I say, where's people? Where are you? And, uh, and slowly in the wings, there was galvanizing sounds. And suddenly, uh, stage manager, And, and I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm trying to find out every implication I can. I remember a little bit of, of, of Ben Johnson. You turdy, feesy, nasty, lousy, particle rogues! I called them. Uh, and it went on for a bit until the, until the set was assembled. At which point, uh, I was just about ready to start the soliloquy. Uh, and Bardolf, bless his cotton socks, decided that I was in real trouble out there. And he came on and said, Sir, sir, Mistress Quickly is at the door. And I thought, I haven't done my soliloquy yet. And I said, well, tell her to wait. <laughs> These things happen. I'm sorry to say that we have come to that time where we've run out of time. So for those of you who have questions, I'm sorry we didn't get to them. Um, you will be at your autograph table later, is that correct? Okay, so if you have a question that you didn't get asked, you could ask it at that point. But please give them a warm round of Edmonton, warm round of applause to Mr. John Reese Davis. Thank you, sir. I, I'd like to, I, I'd like you to know something. People have the impression that actors are bitchy, difficult, uh, and, and, um, and, and, and and beastly people to each other. The real truth is exactly the opposite. We greet anyone that we work with and who is still surviving with a joy and a delight. Because anyone who does survive is not only damn good at what they do, but is probably a damn good person too. And I want to thank you for your generosity in those years. I love you, sir. A marvelous, marvelous actor. Thank till, you. Till next time. Thank you. Till next time. John Reese Davis, everybody.